George, the remarkable picture of the cosmic microwave background has been called the photograph of creation, the face of God, all sorts of extraordinary language. I want to know the real science behind it. Okay, well, I think of it as a photo of the embryo universe, you know, sort of like when you're growing up, there are baby pictures and so forth. This is a picture of the universe was an embryo, sort of like the ultrasound, <laughs> and that's an analogy that's very good in many ways. So let me explain why it is, because it's a photograph of what the universe was like about 400,000 years after the very beginning, which seems like a long time. <laughs> but remember, the universe is nearly 14 billion years old now. And so putting it in human terms, if the universe is in middle age now, that's 12 hours after conception. So uh. that's when the ultrasound is. <laughs> okay. So why do we call it an ultrasound? Well, what you see first when you see it is like looking at a picture of the sun, you see the sun. Later on, if you look more carefully, sometimes you see sunspots, some irregularities on it. But if you look more carefully, you see there's all kinds of standing acoustic waves in the sun. There's just sound waves going all around the sun. And looking at them tells us about the properties of the sun. The same thing is true of the early universe. When it was made, it wasn't made quite perfectly. There were small irregularities in it. And those irregularities show up as sound waves. And when you do the ultrasound, you see the sound waves and they show up and they see you things that later on are going to manifest themselves the same way the, the tiny structures you see on a 12-hour-old embryo will turn into a human being. We see the structures that are going to turn into the modern universe. Yeah, we like those imperfections. If they weren't there, we'd be in trouble, right? right? They're, they're what make the universe interesting and also make it possible for us to be here. Right. We wouldn't have stars. We wouldn't have galaxies. If everything was exactly right, the same. Right. We wouldn't have planets. We wouldn't have us, right? And so those imperfections are, are not... Imperfections is not a right. Those are really nice features. Right. You know, they're extra features added to a very simple, very uniform early expansion of the universe. And so when you make these pictures, the picture you first see when you first make them is that the universe is incredibly uniform. And that means it's not only expanding uniformly in all directions, but the material in it is spread almost uniformly. So it's like looking at a glass of, of water. It's, it's almost uniform everywhere in the water. But when you look more closely, you know, when you, when you keep scaling in, so factor of 10, factor of 100, factor of 1,000, factor of 10,000, you begin to see these very small imperfections. And to give you an idea of that, if you look at a billiard ball, it's round, it's a sphere to about a part in 10,000. So uh, the universe is nearly as perfect, well, it is as perfectly made as a billiard ball is. It rolls really smoothly on the table. The universe is incredibly simple and uniform, simply in what we would call the, the simplest possible state, the ground state of the universe. But then there are these small perturbations that grow in to be these beautiful things that we call galaxies and clusters of galaxies, right. stars, and us, right? And so there's this incredible, you start with this very simple thing, and over time, complicated structure forms and it evolves and gets more complicated until you see something as rich and complex as the world. Now, when you us. look at this, you, it's, it's in every direction, right? Now, what does that mean when you see the same things, basically, everywhere right. you look? So when you look out originally, everything looks the same, uniform in all directions. That means the universe was uniform in all directions, that, that if we're not in a special place, which we think we're not, then the universe is the same no matter where you are on when you look on the large scale, and the same no matter which direction you look. And so that means on the whole, it's the universe is very smooth, like a like a great huge flat carpet, you know. And you look in details and you start seeing the wharf and the weave and so forth. But on the large scale, it's just very uniform. Then you look in more closely, as time has evolved, you have seen clusters of galaxies form, galaxies form, and solar systems form. And that's the little variations that are showing up. But the fact that it's so uniform in all directions tells you the universe at the beginning was extremely simple, but with only these small amounts of extra stuff added. How did this remarkable observation take place? What's the brief history of this remarkable photograph right. that you were well, involved in? In 1965, uh, so less than 50 years ago. And uh, that um, in that time, we've started understanding this radiation must have come from the, from the very beginnings of the universe. It's relic from, from the early phases. And we've studied it and showed that that is the case. That's what the Kobe Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, the Kobe satellite, showed that it truly must be the relic radiation from the Big Bang. And then it's a tool with which we can look at the beginning of the universe. And so over time, people made better and better observations. 
I started back in the 1970s making observations, first on the ground, then on a U-2 airplane, and oh. then in balloons, and then finally in spacecraft. And now we have two spacecraft that have taken data and a third, uh, the Max Planck Surveyor, being prepared for launch next year to survey and study this radiation in more and more detail in order for us to study the early universe in more and more detail so that we can learn more. Because now we have a tool where we can image the early universe, we can look and see what processes were going on in the early universe, and we can see what the universe is made out of. And that, combined with other astronomical observations, let us put together a model of the universe that's extraordinarily good, that with very simple number of parameters and ideas, we can predict almost everything we can see today in a statistical sense. Let's talk about some of the things that this photograph of the early universe can help us predict. Uh, one of the, th the theories that is, is very dominant today is the theory of inflation. That uh, uh, at the very beginning there was this a, a period of, of enormous exponential growth which ended in the hot Big Bang. Uh, how does the photograph that you've shown of the, uh, of the early universe conform with that remarkable theory? Right. So inflation predicts a, a large number of things. I think of it as inflation creates the stage, puts the, you know, the energy and material out there, and puts the actors out there and gives them a little script to start following. And, you know, and then you see what develops in the play. So inflation does an incredible number of things. But the things you can, you can see directly from looking at the relic radiation from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background, is you can measure the geometry of the universe. So we know from Einstein that space-time can be curved. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what is the large-scale structure of space? And we know the answer to that is it's very close to flat. Okay, so how does inflation make the universe flat? Well, that's automatic consequence of inflation, that if you take something that was relatively small and somewhat curved and you make it 10 times as big, the radius of curvature is 10 times bigger, you make it 100 times as big, <laughs> so make it 10 to the 30th times bigger, and the radius of curvature is huge, and we know that the universe is very close to flat, so the radius of curvature is extraordinarily huge, much, much bigger than what we can see. So that's one of the things that we test. The other How do you th test that? How that, is that visually tested? The, the, the interesting thing is we use the sound in the early universe, and we know the speed of sound. It's, it's very simple to calculate. In the early universe, the light, the radiation itself dominates, and it moves at the speed of light. We live in three dimensions, so the light can go in all three different directions. So the mean velocity that sound goes out is the speed of light divided by the square root of three for the three dimensions. So you say, here's the beginning of time, here's 400,000 years. Light will move 400,000 years times, you know, <laughs> speed of light over the square root of three. That's how big these structures should be from the sound waves. And you look and see how big that is and angle, and then it's a simple calculation. If you live in a flat universe, you know your simple plane geometry, you know what the angle should be. If you live in a universe that's, that's spherically curved close, remember you start at the equator and start two parallel lines up, two perpendicular to the equator, they'll meet at the pole, so this convergence. So if you have this sound horizon, the light will converge and it'll look bigger when you extrapolate back with a straight line. And likewise, if the universe is a funnel shape, so everything goes out, so the lines spread apart, you'll see the same thing, that the light will look like it's spreading apart, and so it'll look to be a smaller angle. So you just measure the angle on the sky, and that should be about 0.9 degrees, and it is. And that's, that's just remarkable. And you can measure it to about 1%. So we know that the radius of curvature of the universe is at least 10 times as far as we can see in the universe, which is the 14 billion light years. So already we know the universe is pretty flat. So that tells us that inflation, you know, that one of the predictions of inflation is true. The other prediction of inflation is that there will be quantum mechanical uh, fluctuations because the universe was expanding so rapidly and inflation itself will take those quantum mechanical fluctuations and stretch them up to astronomical scales. So in this model, our galaxy was once a quantum fluctuation and therefore the thing we see in the map, those things are individual quantum fluctuations. So when you look at this map, you're simultaneously seeing what was once the smallest thing in the universe and is now the largest things in the universe. So it's really cool. <laughs> it's way cool. I mean, when most people, you know, don't understand this part, but I mean, you're taking things that are smaller than a proton and you're making them the size of clusters of galaxies. Okay. So the universe is a giant microscope. Right, it, but it does it by actual physical transformation of a microscopic, a tiny, tiny microscopic thing into something so macroscopic that if you got in your car and drove 
you know, for a billion years, you wouldn't even get, you know, you wouldn't even be able to see on the map how far you went. It's, uh, these, you know, it's, it's you know, mil hundreds of millions of light years across. Right? Unbelievable. Well, it's, it, it's unbelievable, but when you work it through, you say, oh my God, it works out perfectly, you know, and, and it's just so spectacular. It's that you, you can't help but get excited about this idea. So inflation is such a beautiful model, it's such a beautiful idea, it explains so many nice things. We want to know if it's really right. And so the, part of the new experiments we're doing is to look for other effects from inflation. There should be, for example, gravity waves. The same ways we got fluctuations, the quantum mechanical fluctuations that produce the energy and matter density fluctuations should also create distortions of space-time that look like gravity waves. And if we can find those, that's like a smoking gun that says inflation happened and this is the energy scale. So there's all kinds of really you know, fun things to do yet.